This podcast is a local production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting and depends on the support of listeners like you. If you can, please donate today at mpbonline.org. And thanks. This is Southern Remedy on MPB Think Radio. I'm Dr. Jimmy Stewart, Professor of Internal Medicine and Pediatrics at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. We are here this morning to answer your questions about any kind of health care topic that you might have. That's right. This is the program where you can call in with just about anything that you are experiencing. Maybe it is a new ailment uh, that you're having, maybe a new symptom. Maybe it's a diagnosis that you received that you didn't quite understand or want to get some more information on or clarification. Or maybe it's a medication that's causing you some problems. Whatever the reason that you need to call, you can call right now. Uh, you can reach us by calling one eight seven seven mpb ring That's one eight seven seven six seven two seven four six four. If you're not able to call, we always welcome your emails. You can email us. Just send those to remedy at mpbonline.org. We do try to get back to you personally, uh, but we also um, try to uh, share those with our listening audience if you give us permission to do that. And you can also check us out both on our website, mpbonline.org, or on uh, uh, subscribe to our podcast. So just whatever your podcasting app is, just search for Southern Remedy and it'll pop right up and you can add that and listen to Southern Remedy at your leisure. Hope everybody's having a great day. It's a little bit, you know, that time of year where it's a little bit um, cooler from time to time. And this morning I was able to get up a little bit earlier and get out there and, and uh, go for a run. And it uh, was nice, particularly in, um, uh, you know, in contrast to what we experience later in the afternoon. So I uh, hope everybody's uh, getting out there and enjoying some of this weather that we have in Mississippi. It's finally, the rains have sort of uh, cut back at least a little bit from what we have in the spring, and there's a lot more opportunities to do that. As you get out there, please be safe, though. There's different things that can sort of sneak up on you. One is dehydration, and uh, certainly here in the south, with our high humidity and increased temperatures, we're already seeing some uh, higher temperatures that can put you at risk if you're outside for long periods of time, particularly if you're on medications that might lend themselves to having more heat damage like diuretics, uh, or if you have chronic uh, illnesses like diabetes or uh, heart failure, you might want to be a little bit more careful about that. If you have the choice of when to be out, make sure that it's early in the morning, again, the cooler times of the day or later in the afternoon, and uh, limit those to short periods of time they're outside. It's always best to hydrate with water. That's what we recommend more than anything else. I know a lot of people do Gatorade, body armor, and those kinds of things, Powerade. Um, but, um, you know, if you're not going to be out there for more than 45 minutes, water works just fine. It's always good to prehydrate um, before you go out. You don't want to go out with a water deficit uh, to begin with. And then lots of other critters that are out there. Um, had a couple of, uh, of patients that came in with uh, tick bites already and, uh, you know, sort of how to do that. Ad- avoidance is probably the best way. There is clothing that you can buy that has permethrin impregnated into it or other chemicals are impregnated into it. These are safe plant derivatives, uh, not harmful to kids or to adults at all, but they do keep those little uh, bugs away that are nasty and bite at you. I have was actually fighting a horse fly this morning as I was running and uh, probably looked like I was having a seizure as I was running down the road. So my apologies to my neighbors if you're, if you're listening this morning. This is Southern Remedy. The number to call is one eight seven seven mpb ring That's one eight seven seven six seven two seven four six four. 672 Call in early um, if you've got that question. You may think that your question is not something that would be applicable to our listening audience. I guarantee you that it is. There's lots of other people out there that are probably thinking or having the same problem. So... Help us get the conversation started this morning. I give you permission to do that right now. We usually have a little bit more time to answer those questions in the first part of the program and certainly don't want to have to cut people off near the end as we get sort of a time crunch there. So go ahead and call right now, one eight seven seven mpb ring That's one eight seven seven. 
672-7464. You know, speaking of those little critters that bite, what do you do once you've had that? Um, I had one uh, four-year-old that came in that actually had a pretty nasty bug bite uh, right around his, uh, the front of his stomach there on his abdomen uh, a couple of days prior and came in with a redness around it. Uh, it's always interesting what people will put on that. Uh, they'll put alcohol and all kinds of other things. Actually, one of the best things you can do if they're old enough, um, over-the-counter Benadryl works just fine because a lot of that is not necessarily an infectious reaction, but an allergic or an irritant type reaction. And Benadryl or something that's longer acting like Zyrtec or Claritin or Allegra work just fine. Um, There's also uh, other things topically you can put on there. I don't typically recommend topical Benadryl just because it doesn't really penetrate into the skin as well. If you're going to use something like that, you need to do it orally uh, as a syrup or a liquid or a um, or a uh, pill or capsule. But uh, you can in older kids uh, just to that area if there's a lot of inflammation, redness, or uh, swelling around it, you can use hydrocortisone cream. So that's something that you can. Uh, you can actually uh, put directly over there, and that can decrease the uh, inflammation considerably. So um, what happens if it does, if it starts draining, or if it's the redness spreads significantly away from that uh, initial site, they, you can get an infection. It Typically, it's the bacteria that's already on the skin. It's not necessarily something from that organism, although we know that you know mosquitoes, ticks, uh, in particular, those two things can transmit a lot of diseases. They're vectors for those. So uh, you can get systemic things from there. But if it's a, a local infection, we've got enough bacteria on our skin uh, to, uh, if you have any kind of like puncture into the skin, that can be a, a way that they can set up shop. And uh, topical antibiotics, again, are very useful for that. So things like polysporin or uh, um, polymyxin or some of the other combinations. Um, and then if it if it's not getting any better after about a day or two or they're running fever, they may need a, an antibiotic by mouth. So you may need to see your physician um, after um, if it's um, spreading like that. This is Southern Remedy. Dr. Jimmy with you this morning. The number to call is one eight seven seven mpb ring That's one eight seven seven six seven two seven four six four. Let's go to Dan, who is from Columbus, I believe. Hi, good morning. A uh, question for you. My um, my da- daughter and son-in-law just bought some, uh, like, an overgrown lot, and there's tons of poison ivy on it. And I know we're all going to get in it and get it. But when I was living in Massachusetts uh, or West Virginia, there was uh, some talk that there's something you can take prior to it to kind of cut back on your chances of getting it. And I was just wondering if you were aware of anything like that and, and you know, what's its availability. Yeah, there there are a couple of medications. I just mentioned a few that in it's interesting in North America at least there's a there's a number of plants that can cause an irritant reaction when you brush up against them. There's some oils that they have on them and poison ivy there's the substance is arushiol is the name of it with a u. And it really is an irritant, and some people are sensitized to it and some of them aren't. That's why some people, you know, my dad was this way growing up. He would like we would go somewhere in the woods and he would just like grab poison ivy and rub it all over himself and uh, probably gave it to me just brushing up against him. But uh, he would show out like that. But some, uh, a lot of people are sensitive to it and it can cause those classic vesicles, those little blisters that are in a linear path, what, uh, you know, as you brush up against it. There's other plants too. So poison oak, poison sumac is another one, but there's a, a whole host of them that uh, that are out there. We should probably ask Felder. He could give us a list of 10 to 20. Um, but, um, you know, what can you take beforehand? Really, is if the oil gets on you, there's not, you know, the, a barrier to that, whether that's clothing or something else, and then washing that separately and thinking about all the different ways, because that oil can stay on there for weeks. And then if you touch it again, like your shoes, you can get it that way. But as far as anything to take beforehand, Antihistamines will cut down on the reaction, but they won't completely cut down on it. I suppose you could take steroids beforehand, but I wouldn't do that just because of all the negative side effects with steroids. Um, it, it, you know, Topical steroids are just fine once you get it, but it, again, it's not going to really protect you 
uh, from uh, from having that uh, sensitivity. So those are the things I would suggest. Know how to recognize it if you're going to have to go through it and get out in that lot and you know be all in it. Wear some gloves. Uh, wash everything with soapy water. You don't really need to do anything more dramatic than that. Um, I tell you what I do is when I'm out in the yard, I go and take a shower and I use a, a detergent instead of a soap. Soap's just fine too, but I found just personally that something like palm olive or um, Blue Dawn or something like that uh, works well to sort of break down those those compounds. So, uh, and again, if it's on your hat, if it's on your shoes, you're going to need to wash those separately, or it's just going to stay on there till you put your shoes back on and you're going to get it again. I'm Dr. Jimmy Stewart. Thanks for listening to the original Southern Remedy podcast. You can get your medical questions answered by sending an email to remedy at mpbonline.org. For a regular dose of medical information, subscribe to the podcast using your favorite podcasting app. The doctor is always in on the original Southern Remedy. I'm Professor Richard Gershon from the University of Mississippi School of Law, host of In Legal Terms. If you're enjoying this podcast, I encourage you to listen to In Legal Terms, the show about you and your rights. We find interesting legal topics to bring to you and let you know how the law affects you. Find In Legal Terms on any podcasting platform on your smart device or on our website, inlegalterms.mpbonline.org. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. This is Southern Remedy on MPB Think Radio. Dr. Jimmy with you this morning answering your questions about any kind of healthcare topic that you might be interested in. It can be something you're dealing with yourself or maybe somebody else, maybe uh, somebody in your family. Can be young, old, whoever. Now is your chance to call in to Southern Remedy for the answers to your questions. The number to call is one eight seven seven MPB ring. That's one eight seven seven six seven two seven four six four. Let's go to Ann, who is from Tennessee. Good morning, Ann. Good morning, Doctor Jimmy. Thank you for taking my call. Um, I have high cholesterol. It's um, Stays around 320 or whatever, but I've had it for absolute years. I'm 73, and my question is, um, I, I, I don't have any other health problems at all. Thank goodness, nothing at all. And I'm active and 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 do a lot, but um, I do not want to take statins. And I was wondering about any anything else other than obviously decreasing red meat, which I've been eating too much of that lately, but decreasing that kind of th- stuff and eating more plant-based um, foods and more exercise. What I'm wondering is, is there anything other than statins? I've heard you talk about Metamucil and fish oil supplements in the past, but I would just like anything that you could you could offer yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, we do have a lot of people who come in and, you know, we just do the regular screenings for heart attack and stroke risk. And part of that is getting that cholesterol checked. And it's good to know your numbers. That was a campaign years ago that the American Heart Association put out. And uh, that's one of the numbers that we want to follow to try to estimate that risk. So if you do have high cholesterol, most of the time, it, although it can change in a lot of people with diet and exercise, there's a lot of that that's determined genetically that you can't change. So we do try to look at the overall risk. And as you get older, that risk goes up anyway. It just makes sense. The older you get, the more there is a chance that you would have a heart attack or a stroke just because it's more common. But it doesn't have to be. Um, So the other things that we use for that risk calculation, including the cholesterol levels, and that it's actually the components of the cholesterol. So it's non-HDL cholesterol and LDL cholesterol and triglycerides. And those three components are plugged into this uh, along with your age, uh, your gender, your um, uh, blood pressure, or if you're a diabetic, if you're on medication, um, all kinds of things that are plugged into there <clears throat> to try to get a sense of what your overall risk is. 
Now, I have seen patients your age that their risk is so low that that doesn't really, you know, doesn't really warrant taking a statin or something like that. So in that case, I wouldn't worry about it. It sounds like you're doing all the things you need to with trying to eat a healthy diet and exercise and um, all the other things that that go into that that reduction of a heart attack or a stroke. But if your risk is a little bit higher, you know, there's not really much else you can do to significantly decrease that. A lot of people will take things like red rice yeast. Um, They'll take uh, certainly high fiber diets tend to be lower in cholesterol. Plant based, as you mentioned, certainly exercise can modulate that. But usually it's just the HDL, not so much the LDL component. But if you're doing all of that, I wouldn't sweat it, honestly. Um, particularly mm-hmm. if you don't have a, you know, a strong family history of heart attack or stroke, I would just keep like doing that. the things that you're doing. And I have those conversations with my patients. You know, could you decrease your risk? Yeah, you can. Particularly if it's high enough. You know, if it's over about seven and a half percent for a ten year risk using that equation. But um, even then. I have some patients who are like, you know, I don't really take want to take a statin or I've taken one and had a significant side effect with it. Um, I think you can have those conversations with people and just really emphasize. And thankfully, it sounds like you're doing the things that I would normally suggest anyway. So kudos to you on that. Mm-hmm. Well, I'll say one thing. Even though I excel in my overall number of cholesterol, my good cholesterol is also really high. So that's a good thing. Yeah, that's why, and that's a reason why you can't just go by that total number. Your total may be 320, but if your HDL is 90, that's actually pretty good. Mm -hmm. Um, So, yeah, you do have to know, you know, HDL for healthy, LDL for lousy. That's the way I tell people to remember it uh, for the good and bad. (laughs) They're like, what does that mean? I can't even remember. I was like, H for healthy, L for lousy. That's the way, it doesn't actually mean that, but that's, that's what it, uh, you know, that's the easiest way to remember. And triglycerides, the higher they are, the worse your risk is. But that's sort of a minor player. The biggest players are that HDL and LDL. I have one final question that I just for, I forgot but now I remembered. So if you do um, a non-fasting versus fasting um, uh, cholesterol test, How does that impact your numbers? Yeah, it can, depending on how they're testing for the cholesterol, particularly if it's one of the mobile-type testing facilities. So there's an indirect way and a direct way that they can test for the LDL cholesterol. Um, Fasting is the best way because it can show you what the true cholesterol is, and that needs to be about six to eight hours of not eating. You can drink water all you want. You can have coffee as long as it doesn't have anything in it. Um, and then tri- triglycerides and LDL are going to be the two things that are affected the most. But there are some ways to check for cholesterol that's more a direct me- measurement that takes some of that into account, and it, the LDL isn't affected. The triglycerides would still be affected. But the best way okay. is to have that six- to eight-hour fast, yeah. Okay. Well, that is so helpful. Thank you so much, for, and I love your show. You're just so amazing and so comforting. Oh, thank you, Ann, and thank, thank you. you for calling. This is Southern Remedy. The number to call is one eight seven seven MPB ring. That's one eight seven seven six seven two seven four six four. Let's go to Brother Daniel from Pascagoula. Hey, what's up, my brother from another mother? <laughs> All right, Daniel, what's going on with you today? Ain't nothing, man. You know how you say we all bleed red. <laughs> That's right. You got that right. Listen, listen um. My, uh, you know, my tooth was kind of bothering me. I, I'm trying to get ready to set up a, uh, uh, appointment for the dentist. But, um, I, I noticed that, uh, I was having a little pain in my arms, but it stopped. Oh, is that another warning to let you know when your blood pressure is a little high? Yeah, it can. Um, and if it's, if it's particularly if it's high enough that it's causing a strain on your heart, Heart pain's weird. It like there's a classic heart pain, which is like somebody says it feels like I've got a pressure in the middle of my chest, like an elephant sitting on my chest, and it's going up into my jaw and down my left arm, and I'm sweaty and I'm short of the breath. Yeah, I ain't been feeling that part yet. Yeah, what's the best fruits for to try to keep your blood pressure down? Is it kiwi? Well, it's actually not just one fruit, but eating a diet that's rich in fruits can be a source of, you know, to get the, that can impact it and get it down. So I wouldn't just choose one. 
uh, you know, I'd get like a sort of a – and vegetables would be something else, too, that can impact it. We know that if you if you eat more fruits and vegetables, not just one, but, but a lot of them and varied, that can make your blood pressure go down. Okay, give you a balance. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Hey, man, I appreciate, I appreciate you give, educating us, man. We need this more and more, and I appreciate it a lot. And thank you, man. Oh, you, you're welcome, Brother Daniel. Hey, it's people like you calling in with these questions that really, um, really make things work. So we do appreciate that. This is Southern Remedy. Dr. Jimmy with you this morning. Uh, the number to call if you have a question about anything, whether it's diet-related or medications or medical conditions, is one eight seven seven mpb ring That's one eight seven seven six seven two seven four six four. Or you can send an email to remedy at mpbonline.org. Dr. Jimmy, I'd like to jump in here with what I always call executive privilege. Uh, <laughs> and I just, uh, um, I've got a dental appointment today, so I've been taking some antibiotics. And I noticed because I take that and I still take my lisinopril for high blood pressure. Um, lisinopril is a small dose, so it is a very teeny tiny pill. The, um, the antibiotic is a big capsule. Is there any rhyme or reason to size and delivery method for various medications? Yeah, I get that a lot. And, you know, some people will just automatically think, well, this pill's so small, it must not be a whole lot of this medication, which is not necessarily true. So the size of the tablet or size of the capsule that a medication is in has to do with the amount of material that you want to deliver, the amount of the, of the medication that needs to be in that dose, and also the delivery method. So a lot of medications are better absorbed in the stomach. Some are better absorbed in the small intestine. So you may have, particularly with a tablet or a, even a capsule too, um, a mechanism that it's it slowly releases that medication. So it's not just the medication either. It's other things in there. And a lot of the extended release medications, you'll see that, that they dissolve slowly over time. In fact, you can even put them in, I uh, wouldn't do it, I'd take it like it says, but if, you know, at some tablets you can put them in, in water or put them in something that's comparable to what the GI tract has with sort of an acidic environment. You can see it may take them a little bit longer to get, um, to get dissolved. And some people uh, also, I should mention, there are, are ghost pill uh, casings. Uh, particularly with not so much with the tablets, but with capsules. So some people will say, I'm not absorbing my medication because I go to the bathroom and there it is uh, mixed in. And that's just because you don't absorb that part of it. So it's it, it dissolves enough to sort of release those things and then uh, the rest of it sort of passes through. But yeah, size, depending on what the fillers need to be in there, and a lot of people are worried about that, but they're actually designed and they have release mechanisms that design that design to release that over time or release it quicker. Um, now, there's a couple of other ways we can deliver medications, of course. we can You can actually start to absorb them as soon as they enter the mouth um, all the way through, really. Uh, but usually by the time you get to the small intestine, the first part of that, they're absorbed and you don't really do anything downstream. Taking them with other things can affect that, too. So, you know, the two you mentioned are not a problem, but sometimes there are like thyroid medications are a big one. If you take those, you have to take those at a different time than other medications or even supplements like vitamin C or uh, calcium because it can interfere with the, the amount that you're absorbing of those. So there's a lot of science behind that, a lot of design mechanisms behind that, too. But great question. Kevin Farrell, our producer, always with a good question with his executive privilege. I'm Dr. Jimmy Stewart. Thanks for listening to the original Southern Remedy podcast. You can get your medical questions answered by sending an email to remedy at mpbonline.org. For a regular dose of medical information, subscribe to the podcast using your favorite podcasting app. The doctor is always in on the original Southern Remedy. Hey, this is Larry Morrissey with the Mississippi Arts Commission. I'm one of the hosts of the Mississippi Arts Hour, the arts interview show on Think Radio. We talk with visual artists, musicians, writers, as well as people who help bring the arts to their communities. We hear about how each artist learned their craft and get some insight into their creative process. You can hear the Arts Hour every Sunday at 5 p.m. on Think Radio. 
or listen anytime by subscribing to the show through your favorite podcasting app. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. Welcome back to Southern Remedy. This is Dr. Jimmy with you this morning answering your questions. Got some great ones all across the board today. The number to call if you have a question about anything related to your health care or someone near and dear to you is 1-877-MPB-RING. That's 1-877-672-7464. Let's go to Brad from Mobile. Good morning, Brad. Thank you for calling. Thank you for taking my call. Um, I am 47, and I am getting ready to have my first colonoscopy, uh, just as a matter of routine. And you always hear more horror stories about the prep than the procedure. And I'm just wondering, are there certain things that I should drink to stay hydrated? People are telling me different things. I don't know what's fact and what's myth. Yeah, they've gotten a lot better with that, um, with the prep um, for it. It used to be just some nasty stuff that you have to just take for three, four days even so to get adequately cleaned out. There's better things that they use now. They can sometimes combine that with a medication called Miralax, which just holds water into the stool so it just flushes everything out. Um, they're going to give, they should have given you pretty good instructions on the amounts and the types of things to drink. And you can drink some things that are usually clear. You don't want to drink something like colas or those kinds of things, but usually like Sprite's fine, anything that's like a clear liquid. And that's going to be on that list. So I would just defer to that list, um, to, um, you know, to, or, or to call them if they didn't give you that. And there's, there's just pretty easy. Now, different places will have a little bit different um, uh, protocols of things that you would need to take or, or drink. But generally speaking, anything that's like clear like that, certainly water is, should be fine. You're not going to okay, need. You, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Specifically, like somebody told me that I should be drinking like Powerade instead of water. And uh, the list just is very vague. It says, you know, water, you know, Gatorade, uh, you know, nothing with certain colors. But um, so I've got the list. I just didn't know if there were certain things that were better than others. Yeah, that that should be fine. I mean, Gatorade, like, and you, you hit the nail on the head. The colors actually can sort of stain the inside of the intestines, and that'll affect what they're actually looking at. So it won't give them a true picture of what's going on. You know, if you think about it, when you get, drink red Gatorade, for instance, It'll be, you know, around your mouth. It'll have sort of a temporary tint to it. That goes away pretty quick. But if it's, you know, in relation to when they're doing the procedure. But beyond that, it shouldn't really matter. Um, You know, the electrolytes that you're going to get, it's sort of mild. I mean, Gatorade, Powerade, those things are sort of geared towards rehydration, not like continued hydration. But that's fine to take. And it has a little bit of sugar in there, too, and, and salt and potassium and a couple other things. But... Uh, that plus water um, should be pretty pretty fine to take. It's just the color is really the thing. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Brad. Yeah, it's sort of a rite of uh, preventive medicine passage is the colonoscopy. There are a couple other ways to check for that for lower-risk individuals, too. There's a, a, a new combination of, um, of ways. One test for actual blood in the stool for small amounts of it, not the amounts that you can see, but much smaller than that with a chemical test. Uh, And they combine that also with a DNA probe. So they actually checked uh, you have to have a a certain amount of stool, and then they check for uh, certain DNA changes that are very specific for uh, early colon cancers or even late-stage colon cancers. So that's really for people who are at less of a risk, and sometimes there can be differences in what insurance will pay for. So, you, you know, if you, that's not an option, certainly the colonoscopy is the best way because you can actually visualize the colon and see any of those uh, small lesions that look sort of suspicious, and they can go ahead and take them out. So if you had the other test and it was positive, you'd still have to have a colonoscopy after that. Some people would just say, well, I'd just rather just have the colonoscopy do be done with it. And usually that's a five to 10 year uh, repeat, depending on what they see. If it's totally clean, they may give you a 10 year bill of health and say, you know what, come back in 10 years. If they see five to seven polyps, uh, some of them high grade, they may say, we want to see you back in a year or two. Um, But it's one of the best screenings we have for cancer. And certainly colon cancer can get to a, a very advanced stage quickly. Uh, you know, we think about, um, oh, like on his name, Chadwick uh, Bozeman, 
the actor who played Bal- uh, Black Panther and several other roles tragically died of uh, metastatic uh, colon cancer. Uh, nobody really knew because he's such a great guy and sort of fought through that. Uh, but that's you know a good example of a younger individual in their 30s or 40s even that can have that. And we have really good ways to screen for that. Families that have a higher risk, we screen earlier. So it's usually about... 10 years earlier from when somebody developed it. Doctor, I wanted to jump back in again. I've had uh, two colonoscopies, and the first one I had uh, went through that, oh, this is awful, so on and so on. And then really I psyched myself out, and so I put the second one I had off by a number of years because I was afraid of the prep. Well, actually, it was on your show that we talked about it once, and you underscored the importance of it and how it, it's great at, you know, at, at, at getting the, the prostate cancer. And so finally I just said to myself, grow up. It's, you know, it's only a couple of hours. It's awful, but it's, you'll get over with it. Plus the stuff, the, the, it's not complete uh, anesthetic, but it's a very pleasant aftermath. Once you get through all yeah. the, the difficult yeah. stuff, the back end is fairly easy. So my recommendation, just as average Joe would be, you know, uh, don't let yourself get too psyched up about it. It's not pleasant, but it'll be over soon. And it's very important to get them done. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, I get the same thing from my patients. They're like, you know, even the clean out these days is not as bad as it used to be. Uh, but once you get to the actual day of procedure, it's very benign. Uh, they give you a little bit of something to not, you know, to be sedated, but not totally out during the procedure. They don't have to, uh, you know, put you put you under completely and you don't remember any of that. And most people are very happy during that time and um and you just sort of get a little nap and you come back and you can start eating again and uh, start doing what you did before so again it takes some time it takes a little bit of effort to get ready for it but um it's one of the better screenings for cancer that we have you know if you have to compare like colonoscopy to mammography for mammograms a lot of people will you know automatically get mammograms and should uh, colonoscopy is actually a better screening technique than mammograms if you had to compare them you know, side by side. So definitely something you need to, to do. I have unfortunately had patients that needed to get colonoscopies, put them off, had some bad outcomes because they didn't catch things until later uh, when it was a little bit harder to deal with. So you definitely want to take advantage of those screenings that your physician recommends to you. Um, there's a lot of evidence behind it about uh, what works and what doesn't work, and they can have those discussions with you in the office. This is Southern Remedy. The number to call is one eight seven seven mpb ring That's one eight seven seven six seven two seven four six four. Let's go to Judy from Tupelo. Good morning, Judy. Good morning. What's your question today? I didn't really have a question. I had a comment. You know, people don't want to take the prep. Uh, don't want to go through that. But on the other hand, do you want to go through chemo, radiation, surgery? Yeah. <laughs> or, yeah. You know, that sort of thing. Yeah, it's it's always better to... to to deal with that on the front even if you if you have cancer a lot of people just scared to death and they're like i don't want to know if i have cancer or not well if you know and it's at an early stage they can do something about it and you're right if you wait then you might have to have chemotherapy some some of my patients have gone in for their screening colonoscopies and they've caught a a cancerous lesion or a suspicious part they have very localized surgery to remove that, and they don't have to have anything else. Their lymph nodes are negative. They don't have any spread to anywhere else, and they've done fine for 10 years. They have their surveillance colonoscopies after that. Uh, So, yeah, it is, again, one of the better ways that we can screen for cancers and catch them early and do something about it, even if you do have cancer. Um, Other people worry about other medical conditions they have. They're like, what is my blood pressure going to do when I go, you know, when I have it done? What is my diabetes going to do? There's very specific things we can do for those, uh, you know, for those other conditions going into it, particularly the diabetes. Blood pressure almost always goes down. Anytime you receive any kind of sedation, uh, blood pressure will come down. That's just a natural response the, to sedation that the body has. So it's it's not unusual to, to see that. Um, and there's always, you know, uh, higher risk individuals that you can have that discussion with your gastroenterologist and they have the resources and the training to know how to change things so that it's a safer procedure for you. But 
very minimally invasive procedure. I know it doesn't sound like it when they describe it sometimes, but really it's it's one of the, the easiest procedures that they can do, and they do a lot of them because they work. So thank you, Judy. Well, oh, go ahead. I have uh, three family members with colon cancer, mm. and uh, so I get screened every time I'm supposed to get, get screened. Right now I'm on three years because I found some polyps, but uh, I even – went and got screened when I didn't have good insurance. And I was laying there on the table, and I told the nurse, I said, pay now, I'll pay later. And she said, what do you mean? I said, well, I either pay now and have the test or pay much more later and have colon cancer. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's true, and it's a much, it's a whole lot more you know, that you that you pay in a lot of different ways, not just monetarily later, but um, in time and what you have to go through. So, um, so Judy, thank you for that testimonial. Certainly, there are families that unfortunately have the higher risk like that. There's actually some families that have some genetic disorders uh, that have uh, increased polyps and increased risk of having colon cancers, and those individuals actually get colonoscopies really early, like in their twenties or thirties and are monitored um, uh, throughout their lives a a lot more. Most of the rest of us, you know, colon cancer develops because of the foods we eat, really. It's the what we, um, the environment of the intestines and what kind of foods that we put through them. You know, foods that are much more processed, that have high salt content, um, that are uh, cooked more, um, there's a higher risk in populations of or individuals that eat those foods of colon cancer. Much less risk if you eat lots of fruits and vegetables, um, less red meats, less processed meats. Again, one of the best diets you can eat, Mediterranean diet. Doesn't totally prevent you from getting colon cancer, though, so we still would recommend that screening uh, just to, um, to make sure we catch things early. I'm Dr. Jimmy Stewart. Thanks for listening to the original Southern Remedy podcast. You can get your medical questions answered by sending an email to remedy at mpbonline.org. For a regular dose of medical information, subscribe to the podcast using your favorite podcasting app. The doctor is always in on the original Southern Remedy. If you ever miss one of our locally produced shows or want to simply hear it again, you can find what you need at mpbonline.org or download our podcast app to your smartphone. MPB programming is on your schedule at mpbonline.org. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. This is Southern Remedy on MPB Think Radio. Dr. Jimmy Stewart with you this morning. And I got some great questions. Talked a lot about all kinds of different things. And uh, the number to call if you have a question, still got some time in the hour to squeeze a couple of more questions in, is 1-877-MPB-RING. That's 1-877-672-7464. Or if you'd like to send us an email, you can send those to remedy at mpbonline.com. Dot org. We talked early in the hour about some of the more late spring and summer things to avoid, all those nasty insects biting you out there. A lot of people worry about, hey, I, I think I may have gotten bitten by a spider. You know, I always check my shoes. If I've left them outside, I'm like beating them all upside down all, all over everything to get those spiders out. The truth is most of the spiders that you find in places like that are totally benign. They, a lot of them can't even penetrate the skin, and the venom that, that they have, if they can, doesn't cause any more damage than, say, a bee sting or um, an ant bite. Um, so um, you know, the, there are a couple of spiders that have other toxins in them that if they do inject that in an appreciable amount, sometimes you can have problems. But if you see a spider on you and you have a little spider bite, don't worry about it. Um, make sure you monitor it. Uh, 
Make sure you keep it clean. Go wash it off with some just regular soap and water at that point. You might want to put some hydrocortisone cream on it or take some Benadryl. Uh, but only if it spreads, if it's, you know, if it gets red and spreads and looks like it might get infected. It, even then, it may can just be treated with an antibiotic and you don't have to do anything else. And everybody worries about the black widows and the brown recluses, but they're not as common as you think. And most spiders will get off of you and get out of your way without any kind of problem. But we do have a lot, and uh, you might want them around in some cases uh, to get rid of some of those other nasty insects. So just something to think about. This is Southern Remedy. The number to call is one eight seven seven mpb ring That's one eight seven seven six seven two seven four six four. Let's go to Dwayne in Hattiesburg. Good morning, Dwayne. Oh, are you there, yeah, Dwayne? Morning. Yeah, I'm here. What's your question Look, this morning? I'm having problems with my hips and my calves. Uh, when I walk short distances, they pain real bad, and I, I have to constantly sit down and let them stop hurting. Yeah, tell me a little bit more about that, Dwayne. So particularly on your calves, so is it a, a crampy type pain or is it a sharp pain? What type of pain is it? It's a it's a it's a crampy type thing, like I've run long distance or or done a lot of squats. Gotcha. And do you have any other medical problems like high blood pressure or diabetes? Uh, my blood pressure is a little high, but they haven't recommended medication for me. Gotcha. Um, so I would I would get this checked out. A couple of things come to mind, um, particularly if it starts in your hips and goes down to your calves. But it it may be one of two th- uh, one of a number of things. Um, you can have just normal you know muscle aches, depending on a couple of different factors. But in your case, particularly with some of the symptoms that you're having, um, I would I might be a little bit concerned, and and you might need to get the blood flow checked out to those lower lower parts of your legs sometimes if you're not getting enough blood flow to your lower extremities it can cramp up like that and you you described it very nicely what we normally would hear uh you know it's like if you ran a long distance or you really use those muscles um, and it happens more so if you're walking because you're using those muscles and they need more blood supply so that's one thing i would probably get checked out it's an easy check In the office, they're going to do a physical exam. They may ask you some more questions, and uh, they're going to check your pulses and your lower extremities to make sure they feel okay. But even if they do, they may want to get a test called a Doppler that looks at the blood flow to your lower extremities to make sure there's enough blood flow there. Um, If it's not, uh, then they can intervene. There's a way to do that with stents to try to open up those blood vessels. That's just one thing. I'm not saying that's what you have, but definitely with the type of symptoms that you're having, I might want to explore that more. A lot of people have calf pain for various reasons. The nerves or nerve entrapment that go to the lower legs can also be a source of that, particularly if it starts in your hips and sometimes even from your back. Uh, So there can be uh, situations where you have a... Um, a disc in your back that sits between the the vertebra uh, the vertebral bodies uh, in your backbone it can sort of slip out or protrude out and press on a nerve and that can be felt not just in the back but all the way down your leg um, there's another condition that that can actually um, narrow the canal where your spinal cord um, travels down your back and that can same, sometimes have some similar symptoms particularly in, when you walk um, but that's that's going to be teased out with a good, a more in-depth history, uh, with a really good physical exam, and maybe a couple of tests after that. But you got enough symptoms, I'd probably you know want you to get checked out. Um, thanks a lot. All right, Dwayne, thank you for calling. Yeah, lower extremity pain can be difficult to diagnose, and it does take a lot of detective work and a lot of repeating it in the office. Sometimes it, I'll even have my patients come out and walk down the hallway or even walk outside to try to reproduce some of this pain, um, you know, in, in real time. Uh, that's, that's very useful to sort of tease out what it might be. But um, claudication is what I was describing to Dwayne. So it's basically it's not enough blood flow to uh, whatever muscle group. It's so sort of similar to angina of the heart or heart pain that's caused by decreased blood flow. Um, and it's the same cramping type or squeezing type pain. 
And it's usually with activity. Actually, I had a patient this week that had some similar symptoms, and he complained at, uh, at night. As he lays down, he had more symptoms, and he just sort of swings over the bed and lays his legs off the bed. And if you think about it, that's a great way to get more blood flow to your lower extremities because you're using gravity to do that. Uh, but that's claudication that's caused by decreased blood flow. Uh, usually goes along with with narrowing of arteries, uh, arteries in other places. So peripheral artery disease is very common. If you have, say, uh, uh, a narrowed blood flow somewhere else, then that's something else that your physician should be looking at is what's going on with your arteries and your lower extremities, particularly if you have hypertension, diabetes, high cholesterol, some of those things that can sort of contribute to that. This is Southern Remedy. The number to call if you have a question is one eight seven seven mpb ring That's one eight seven seven six seven two seven four six four. Or you can email us, email those questions to remedy at mpbonline.org. And peripheral artery, artery disease, too, it can be sort of sneaky, and you don't have to have all those other risk factors. I should have asked Dwayne, too, if he smoked, because that's a huge one. That can put you at an increased risk. Nicotine in smoking in cigarettes, or if you if you dip or have a, a way to transmit it orally, it's a really good constrictor of peripheral v- uh, blood vessels. Uh, talk to a hand surgeon if you have access to one. They'll tell you that absolutely even small amounts of tea, Uh, of the caffeine that's in tea and coffee, they don't recommend doing that because it can have the same type of constrictive effect if they're doing a repair of a digit um, peripherally. So that's just something to keep in mind. But smoking is a big one that can cause a lot of damage to blood vessels in your lower extremities. Uh, Waiting on a caller here. This is uh, Francis from Mobile. Good morning, Francis. Thank you for calling. Oh, Francis, you're, yes, ma'am, you're on there. We've got about a minute left, so go ahead. Okay. I know you've never heard a woman call and say her husband won't go to the doctor. <laughs> never heard that, Francis. <laughs> my husband's Achilles tendon hurt, and he says, well, I've got tendonitis, and I say, well, go to the, your, our doctor, and he says, they can't do anything about that. But that's not true, is it? Isn't there something they could do to help him? Yeah, there's a lot of things, and particularly in conjunction with a physical therapist, um, they, which I know takes a lot, a little bit more time, but there's some things that you can do for the shoes. There's some things that you can do uh, to help loosen up that. There's some stretches that you can do that you don't have to do just when you go to the physical therapist. You could do it other places. And then there may be something that's causing it that might be an easy fix. So all of those things okay. can be, you know, something that he needs to get checked out. So you tell him I said that I would go because <laughs> if he's going to complain about it every day, he needs to go and do something about it. Isn't it? Now, does he go to our family physician or to an orthopedist or where? I'd go to the family physician first, and then they can probably, okay. if they feel like they need him to go to an orthopedic surgeon, they may even just go straight to physical therapy. Thanks for listening to this MPB Think Radio podcast. MPB depends on support from listeners, so if you can, please contribute today at mpbonline.org. Hello, I'm Dr. Nancy Lotridge anderson president of New Perspectives, a fee-only financial advising firm and co-host of Money Talks. For over 10 years, Money Talks has been answering your personal financial questions and sharing knowledge about money management. Money Talks can be heard Tuesdays at 9 a.m. on MPB Think Radio. Podcasts can be found on our website, money.mpbonline.org.